poor, beautiful little Alice. She was such a lovely girl, always wearing frilly blue, pink and yellow dresses. She was adored for her imagination and loved by everyone, her parents most of all. Perhaps, however, her imagination was too powerful. Childhood At the age of five, Alice was cute as a button, and her imagination would run wild. She had the most wild dreams of crazed animals, gigantic flowers, tiny people, and it was all nonsense. However, in this fantasy dream world, she felt at home. She felt right. Her parents never had issues getting her to go to sleep, and whenever they asked if she wanted to stay up for a night, she would always reply with, No, my hatter is waiting, and rush off to bed. They would laugh it off, knowing the hatter was a friend she fantasised about in her dreams. One day, though, Alice noticed her dreams began to leak into her waking life. She felt no fear, no worry, only happiness that she could visit her wonderland whenever she wished. She began telling her parents, friends and other family of this fantastical nonsense world. They would tell her it was only her imagination, and that it wasn't real. But the more they said, the more aggressively she pushed that it was real. Eventually, the family came to the decision to have her evaluated. She was diagnosed with schizophrenia, and fearing the loss of their daughter, the parents agreed to take in a nurse, one that would act in place of a nanny, but would actually be in charge of watching Alice's development. An extended study of sorts. Just like the rest, Alice would try and push her fantasies onto the nurse, and at first the nurse would report truthfully that Alice was still seeing things. However, as time went on and Alice's parents became more and more distant, the nurse began to love Alice. Having never had a child, out of inability due to being infertile, she would accept Alice's fantasies but also put her own motherly fantasies onto Alice. One day, however, the nurse reported seeing... things. Shadows. Animals with disconnected yet fully working limbs. And people with long, stretched smiles and pale skin. One in particular, a tall, lanky man wearing a suit of patches and tears was always around Alice. When asked about him, Alice would simply say, he's my hatter. After a few days of these delusions, the nurse's reports became more and more nerve wracking. She was seeing dead people, families, things she couldn't even describe or wouldn't. She committed suicide soon after. After the death, Alice's parents were forced to have her admitted to a mental care institution. She was only there for two months, but the doctors said that she had made tremendous progress and was ready to return home. So she did, and Alice went back to ordinary life, spending time with school friends, playing games, anything a normal child would do. About a year later, both of her parents committed suicide. The reason is still unknown. Alice was then sent to live in an orphanage where until she was grown, nothing happened, but her imagination did once again begin to flourish. Adulthood. After leaving the orphanage, Alice made a life. She got a job at a local theatre and an apartment. She was on track, but her imagination was as powerful as ever. If you were to take a peek through her eyes, you might see people as steam power robots or anthropomorphic animals, maybe even disfigured humans with white, pale skin and long smiles. 
she would often refer to people as what she saw, like a cashier she called Rabbit Man, or her neighbour, which she called the Tin Woman. Eventually, Alice found a man who she called her Hatter. That was his name to her. Over time, the two fell in love and moved in together, sharing a life together they were happy. Alice still only ever called him her Hatter, and never once used his real name, at times even disputing what the man's name was. When it seemed to go too far, the man finally asked her why she called him her Hatter. Alice began to explain her childhood, how she had seen things her whole life and how she couldn't understand why no one else saw them. After all was said, the man asked, Well, you know it's only your imagination, right? This one phrase set off a series of fights, Alice defending her reality and the man trying to pull her into his reality. One morning, however, the man woke to the same fate as the nurse so many years ago. He saw things. Strange things. He saw all the walls of their apartment covered in hundreds of different wallpapers, each with its own unique design and colouring. The floor beneath their bed had become grass that he could feel between his toes. The mirror in their bathroom had become a painting of a sad clown, and a giant tree grew in their living room. Over time, the man saw more and more strange animals and people. He couldn't explain it. He wondered if Alice's reality was the true reality after all. Deciding to take a look outside, he opened the door to the apartment and stepped outside. What he saw was a wretched, horrible beast. It was like a cat, with a dog's face, covered in blue fur and lined with holes that oozed a thick red liquid akin to blood. It bared its fangs at the man and a horrible sound echoed from its mouth. The whimper of a baby that soon became a roaring cry. He ran from the beast and into the apartment, opening the door to their bedroom, dashing in and closing it behind him. Alice was sitting on the bed, wearing the frilly blue dress she was famous for, but it was different. It was covered in bloodstains all around the bottom, a white apron, which was also covered in bloodstains, fit over the front of the dress. Sitting at the edge of the bed, she asked, What is the matter, my hatter? The man explained how he could see things, things that should not exist. Alice became giggly and excited about how he was finally seeing it, seeing her world. He didn't understand, he couldn't. How was he seeing her delusions? Was it a shared hallucination? What was going on? His mind raced, fearing what might appear before him next. Alice stood and walked towards the man. Without a word more, she planted her lips onto his and took his face into her palms and feeling her warm red lips, he melted into the kiss, closing his eyes. Soon, as if triggered by the kiss, the man was confronted with an onslaught of memories, of how as a child he would see things, fantastical things, the same things he was seeing now. He remembered killing his parents, thinking they were monsters, and being sent to the orphanage meeting the girl who called him her Hatter, then being bullied so horribly that he locked it all away inside his memories to never see that world again. As the man opened his eyes, his clothes had changed. He was now wearing a patchwork suit and holding a long kitchen knife with circles carved into the blade. On the other end of the blade was Alice, who he plunged the dagger into 
and as he looked down, she held a similar dagger into him. Together, in each other's arms, they collapsed. About a week later, they were found, and the police classified it was a double suicide and moved on. This, however, was not the case. We moved. Not homes, not places. We moved worlds. We went back home. We're here now, in the world of fantastical dreams. And if you ever wish to visit, just close your eyes and imagine. Extended Warranty by Reddit user NinjaGall15 in r slash short scary stories. I get two to three calls like this a day, and I'm sick of it. Most of the time I'm at work, so I simply silence my phone or deny the calls. As a millennial, I hate answering the phone at all, but on my days off, I absolutely love getting these spam calls because I can mess with the caller. Has this ever worked? On anyone? I ask sometimes. Oh, I, I only own a horse and buggy, can't afford a car. Can you still sell me a warranty? Stories I make up on the spot, always the most fun. So when you visit family on holidays, what do you tell them you do? Every now and then they turn into personal insults, especially when they call when I'm still in bed. Sometimes I just hold my throat and screech until they hang up. Spite motivates me here. I will wait on hold for 15 minutes just for the chance to fuck with these people, and I don't feel bad. Their job is literally to scam hard-working people out of money. I don't have any moral qualms about giving them a hard time. I got a call on the way to work from them, Spam risk showing up on my caller ID. I accepted the call, listening to the hold music through my Bluetooth. Finally, I got to a person. Hi, this is Ben from Cargo. Can I get your vehicle year and model? The loser asked, his voice nasally and weak. Yeah, I've got a nicer car than you do because I have skills and work for a living. You've probably got a rental that you use on weekdays to get back and forth to your scam artist job. Do you think yourself funny, Matthew? His voice asked, ice cold. I was laid off and forced into this job. How would you feel if you were just as helpless? I groaned. The sympathy card was new, but not unexpected. You're scamming people to help yourself... You're a parasite, and you make me sick. He chuckled, so unlike the whiny kid that had answered. I'll be seeing you very soon, Matthew. Unless you want to give me your vehicle information here and now. I refused, swore at him a little more, then hung up. It left me unnerved all day. My phone kept buzzing from spam numbers to the point where I had to put it on silent just to avoid the annoyance. After work, I slumped into my car, exhausted. I started up, letting it run for a little before putting it in gear. I feel a little sting at my neck, startled that a bug got in my car. It's December after all. Suddenly, my hands slumped down and I found I couldn't move my body. A small shape and dark voice rose up in the back seat. This is Ben from Cargo. We've been trying to reach you about your car's extended warranty. Do you ever feel like you're being watched? By Reddit user no name idea 18 in r slash short scary stories. Have the hairs on the back of your neck ever stood up for no reason? Have you ever seen something in the corner of your eye 
or a shadow in a dark room? Do you ever feel like you are being watched? Because you are. When you try and look, however, there's never anything there. That's because they're already gone. Pray that you don't see them. If you do, it's already too late. They look just like us, but they're not. They just stand and watch, waiting for you to turn around and see them. See them standing right there in the open, watching you. You'll know it's them as soon as you see them. You can try to ignore the urge to look, but sooner or later you will give in. They know this. You can't outrun them. You can't hide from them. You can't ignore them either. They know if you've seen them. There's no use pretending otherwise. It won't make a difference. Once you've seen them, they've seen you. And when that happens, there's no going back. After that, it's up to you. You can try and run, try and keep them at bay, but you'll be running for the rest of your life. Or you can accept it and go to them. They can't move. They can only stand and watch. Watch as you see them. Watch as you stand there and make the decision to run or accept your fate. If you do decide to run, they will find you. They never stop. I don't know what happens when they reach you, or you reach them. I assume you become one of them, but I can't know for sure. No one can. Until you see them, you can't know what you'll do. Either way, it's too late. Me? I ran. I've been running for three years. I don't know how much longer I can run for. As I type this, I'm sitting on a train 4,000 miles from when I saw the first of them. Every time I see them, there's more of them, and they're getting closer. I know my time is running out. The most I can do now is spread the message and this warning. Please. Whenever you feel like you're being watched, no matter how much you want to, however strong the temptation is, do not look. I'm Losing Weight by Reddit user Kufik in r slash Short Scary Stories For the past two months, I've been losing weight, slowly but surely. It's not a big problem, really, as during the semester I have gained a lot and, to be honest, I'm still a bit chubby, despite the constant weight loss. Still, it is a bit strange, as I have not changed my habits at all and have not started exercising as I have promised myself. It must be the lack of sleep, you see, around three months ago, I started to have a recurring dream. You know the one, where your teeth fall out. Except in my dreams, it's only one at a time, but always a different one. The dream comes every five or six nights, and I wake up drenched in sweat, completely exhausted. The first couple of times I rushed out to the bathroom to have a look, but all my teeth were there. The same cigarette yellowed ones. It's strange, you know, I eat a lot more than I used to, but when I finish, I still feel hungry. It occurred to me that I may have a parasite. Thought of a multitude of worms crawling around in my guts is not a pleasant one. I have been to the doctor's office, but they couldn't find anything in my faecal sample except signs of malnourishment. I have been advised to eat more. Great. Thanks, Sherlock. One thing I noticed is off, aside from the dreams, is that it has been getting harder and harder to clean my teeth. 
little pieces of food somehow manage to stick really hard between them and on them, and I have to scrub for a really long time to get rid of them. I know for sure that I have a parasite, it can't be anything else, but they hide themselves so good that doctors can't find them. I have a plan. I'm going to starve them. If they have no food, they have to consume me, and they can't do that without revealing themselves. The first day of starvation was easy. I only drank water, and aside from discomfort, nothing was really bothering me. On the second day, however, I discovered that I started to chew on the inside of my mouth and tongue. Little cuts were spread all over them. By the end of the day, the cuts opened further and were bleeding constantly. I have to go to the doctor tomorrow because this is not normal. But now I have to sleep. The blood loss and the starvation weakened me. I started brushing my teeth to get the metallic taste out of my mouth. The toothbrush caught on something, and pulling it out was painful and hard. Inspecting the bloody tool, I found some of the bristles were missing. Strange, but I had no time to think on it, uh, as I was feeling worse and about to faint. I tripped before the bed, and as I was losing consciousness under it, I saw teeth. During the summer of 2003, events in the northeastern United States involving a strange, human-like creature sparked brief local media interest before an apparent blackout was enacted. Little or no information was left intact, as most online and written accounts of the creature were mysteriously destroyed. Primarily focused in rural New York State and once found in Idaho, Self-proclaimed witnesses told stories of their encounters with a creature of unknown origin. Emotions ranged from extremely traumatic levels of fright and discomfort to an almost childlike sense of playfulness and curiosity. While their published versions are no longer on record, the memories remained powerful. Several of the involved parties began looking for answers that year. In early 2006, the collaboration had accumulated nearly two dozen documents dating between the 12th century and present day, spanning four continents. In almost all cases, the stories were identical. I've been in contact with a member of this group and was able to get some excerpts from their upcoming book. A Suicide Note, 1964 As I prepare to take my life, I feel it necessary to assuage any guilt or pain I have introduced through this act. It is not the fault of anyone other than him. For once I awoke and felt his presence, and once I awoke and saw his form. Once again I awoke and heard his voice, and looked into his eyes. I cannot sleep without fear of what I might next awake to experience. I cannot ever wake. Goodbye. Found in the same wooden box were two empty envelopes addressed to William and Rose, and one loose personal letter with no envelope. Dearest Linny, I have prayed for you. He spoke your name. A journal entry, translated from Spanish, 1880. I have experienced the greatest terror. I have experienced the greatest terror. I have experienced the greatest terror. I see his eyes when I close mine. They are hollow, black. They saw me and pierced me. His wet hand. I will not sleep. His voice A Mariner's Log, 1691 He came to me in my sleep. From the foot of my bed I felt a sensation. He took everything. We must return to England. We shall not return here again at the request of the rake. 
From a Witness, 2006. Three years ago, I had just returned from a trip from Niagara Falls with my family for the 4th of July. We were all very exhausted after a long day of driving, so my husband and I put the kids right to bed and called it a night. At about 4am, I woke up thinking my husband had gotten up to use the restroom. I used the moment to steal back the sheets, only to wake him in the process. I apologised and told him I thought he'd got out of bed. When he turned to face me, he gasped and pulled his feet up from the end of the bed so quickly his knee almost knocked me out of the bed. He then grabbed me and said nothing. After adjusting to the dark for half a second, I was able to see what caused the strange reaction. At the foot of the bed, sitting and facing away from us, there was what appeared to be a naked man, or a large, hairless dog of some sort. Its body position was disturbing and unnatural, as if it had been hit by a car or something. For some reason, I was not instantly frightened by it, but more concerned as to its condition. At this point, I was somewhat under the assumption that we were supposed to help him. My husband was peering over his arm and knee, tucked into the fetal position, occasionally glancing at me before returning to the creature. In a flurry of motion, the creature scrambled around the side of the bed and then crawled quickly in a flailing sort of motion right along the bed until it was less than a foot from my husband's face. The creature was completely silent for about 30 seconds, or probably closer to five, it just seemed like a while, just looking at my husband. The creature then placed its hand on his knee and ran into the hallway, leading to the kids' rooms. I screamed and ran for the light switch, planning to stop him before he hurt my children. When I got to the hallway, the light from the bedroom was enough to see it crouching and hunched over about 20 feet away. He turned around and looked directly at me, covered in blood. I flipped the switch on the wall and saw my daughter, Clara. The creature ran down the stairs while my husband and I rushed to help our daughter. She was very badly injured and spoke only once more in her short life. She said, he is the rake. My husband drove his car into a lake that night while rushing our daughter to the hospital. They did not survive. Being a small town, news got around pretty quickly. The police were helpful at first and the local newspaper took a lot of interest as well. However, the story was never published and the local television news never followed up either. For several months, my son Justin and I stayed at a hotel near my parents' house. After we decided to return home, I began looking for answers myself. I eventually located a man in the next town over who had a similar story. We got in contact and began talking about our experiences. He knew of two other people in New York who had seen the creature we now referred to as the Rake. It took the four of us about two solid years of hunting on the internet and writing letters to come up with a small collection of what we believed to be accounts of the rake. None of them gave any details, history or follow-up. One journal had an entry involving the creature in its first three pages and never mentioned it again. A ship's log explained nothing of the encounter, saying only that they were told to leave by the rake. That was the last entry in the log. There were, however, many instances where the creature's visit was one of a series of visits with the same person. Multiple people also mentioned being spoken to, my daughter included. This led us to wonder if the rake had visited any of us before our last encounter. I set up a digital recorder near my bed and left it running all night, every night for two weeks. I would tediously scan through the sounds of me rolling around in the bed each day when I woke up. By the end of the second week, I was quite used to the occasional sound of sleep while blurring through the recording at eight times the normal speed. This still took me almost an hour every day. 
on the first day of the third week, I thought I heard something different. What I found was a shrill voice. It was the rake. I can't listen to it long enough to even begin to transcribe it. I haven't let anyone listen to it yet. All I know is that I've heard it before. And now I believe that it spoke when it was sitting in front of my husband. I don't remember hearing anything at the time, but for some reason the voice on the recorder immediately brings me back to that moment. The thoughts that must have gone through my daughter's head make me very upset. I've not seen the rake since he ruined my life, but I know that he has been in my room while I slept. I know and fear that one night I'll wake up to see him staring at me. There was a stupid urban legend that we told each other when we were children. It grew from a whisper, as these things tend to do. The story said that there was a man with no legs who chased children and ate their skin. Lacking legs, he would run after them on his hands. In order to easily remove their skin, he kept his fingernails long and sharp. And when he gave chase, they would tap against the ground, giving him the name Mr. Clickety Clack. We managed to scare each other by embellishing tales of walking home from the playground and hearing the dreaded clickety clack behind us faster and faster as we ran. The story had such a hold on us that some of the younger children could be made to cry by simply tapping your fingernails against the desk and saying, here he comes, Mr. Clickety Clack. Silly really, a harmless, creepy story to tell at sleepovers, except we took it too far. Daniel Ryan was one of those weedy kids one we tortured just for the fun of it, and he absolutely hated any mention of Mr. Clickety Clack. The story freaked him out more than anyone else, and because we were kids, and kids are mean, we used it against him. Poor Daniel, it went on for years and years, fingernails tapping on any available surface as he passed, and the constant chant, here he comes, Mr. Clickety Clack. Here he comes, Mr. Clickety Clack. The thing is, I'd forgotten all about Daniel and that stupid story years ago. We grew up, moved away, lived our lives. Until just recently. My work as a nurse brought me to St. Patrick's Hospital, a mental health facility where I was to work with long-term patients. I had high hopes of making a difference in their lives, working with them to help them be more involved in society, and I had some great success stories. So much so that the director called me in one day and asked me to work with one of the most difficult cases. I don't need to spell it out for you. Of course, it was Daniel. I knew him the minute I saw him. Still weedy, still scared, but now a man and not a boy. He was thin and pale, a life spent institutionalised, showing in the pallor of his skin and the dark rings around his eyes. The worst part was, he had let his fingernails grow long and sharp and was constantly tapping them against the wall, muttering to himself. I knew, even before I had crept close enough to hear, what those words would be. Here he comes, Mr. Clickety Clack. Here he comes, Mr. Clickety Clack. I'm ashamed of what I did next. I could have gone to him, talked to him. Maybe an acknowledgement of what we had done could have helped him. Instead, I turned on my heel and left, fast as I could, out of his room, out of the building, and home to a very large glass of scotch. Given the chance, I like to think I would have gone back the next day and really worked at helping him, but I'll never know. When I was about halfway through my second scotch, the phone rang. Emergency summons to the hospital via the director. An escape. Yes, 
of course, it was Daniel. Some poor night nurse went in with meds and he jumped her, fairly skinning one side of her face with those long, sharp nails. The director was in shock, kept muttering about how the patient has never shown any signs of violence before. I guess it was my presence that did it. Shook the final part loose. For weeks, the talk of the hospital was the escape, and the highly confidential footage from outside Daniel's room that somehow everyone had seen. Daniel, moving inhumanly fast, running the length of the hospital corridor on his hands, his nails eerily going clickety-clack on the hardwood floors. I probably should have told someone then what we had done, what the story had been about. Old Mr. Clickety-Clack and his penchant for skinning children. I was afraid, you see, we had driven Daniel to this. I was well respected. I'd never work again. It's too late now to speak up. Once they found the first child, I knew I couldn't tell. They blame me for it. In the past six months, there have been seven children found all skinned. I've been finding it hard to sleep, knowing he's out there, knowing we created him. Please, please, keep your children close. Don't let them walk out alone. Be careful, and if you are walking home and you hear it behind you, clickety-clack, clickety-clack, then run. Run as fast as you can, and don't look back. He is out there. Have you ever wondered why, when you're alone in a room, you never really felt alone? Or why children have imaginary friends who don't always seem to be imaginary? I'm sure any typical scientific explanation is floating around somewhere. But is it always the truth? A simple, comforting cover-up for what is actually there? I was 13 when the visions began. I thought maybe I just wasn't getting enough sleep. Or possible stress from school. You know, coming from a dysfunctional family and long hours of school add up. After the months that followed my 13th birthday, I began to hear voices, and to be followed by things of a dark nature. I never stopped to question it. That was until my next birthday. My grandmother sat me down and told me of the family lineage that would make me understand the things that I saw and heard, but never understood. A gift, if that's what you would call it. A gift that was passed on through my family that I had regrettably gotten. She had long since passed away, leaving me alone with this curse that I have received through birth. I had always felt comfortable in my home. It was a small house, of course. Two bedroom and a large master bedroom that took up the whole upper floor. But it was different at night. I was occasionally woken up in the middle of the night by the urge of having to believe myself. You have to understand that our house was rather old, some of the door handles on our doors were no longer there, and the bathroom was no different. As I sat there going about my business, the door would slowly open until I spoke out. I'm in here. Then it would simply stop opening. I pushed aside the experience, thinking maybe it was just the airflow or something. I was young and still didn't completely grasp the concept of truth. Another incident was the tall man. I would sleep facing the wall, since my bed was set up against it, and from time to time there would be a tall shadow that would linger on my wall. I never felt threatened by it, but it was strange. He never said anything. He would just stand there while I tried to sleep. Nothing of my visions would bother me. That was until I moved into the new house. 
The new house I was soon to move into was much larger than my old one. It was charming and friendly. My parents had bought it off an old friend of theirs who was selling it because she and her husband had divorced and she was moving out to California. Before we could move in, my parents remodelled it. Six months had passed and we were finally able to move into it. The first night was quiet and peaceful. My parents ordered takeout, since we hadn't gotten in all of our appliances yet. We were fully settled in a few weeks after our move, and for the first time in a long time, I hadn't seen or heard a thing. Maybe moving here wasn't such a bad thing. Around the time of my move, I graduated into high school. I had always thought to myself, what could be scarier than high school? I never imagined I would find something worse. Months after the move, I slept restlessly. The few hours I did get would leave me groggy in the morning. I was tired. I struggled to keep up with the routine I was forcing myself into. Get up, go to school, survive the day, and home anything in between I wouldn't bother to remember. Not because it wasn't important, but because I really didn't remember. At the age of 15, I'd gotten my first job working at a local food joint. My parents' relationship had basically deteriorated after the move. 20 years of being together, and 10 of them being married. They finally split and got a divorce but they remained living together for the sake of the family. But it didn't stop them from arguing, or the drinking for that matter. Neither of them had worked since we moved here, so I got a job to feed the family. I worked double shifts when I could. The money wasn't much, but it was better than nothing. We were burning through what was saved in the bank and it wouldn't last forever. Every night I would pass out in my bed for the few hours of sleep I would get. Only to be woken up a few hours into the night and not able to fall back asleep. The feeling in the room would keep me awake. It was... unsettling. Like being watched carefully by a hunter seeking its prey. In the morning I would find what was clean and wear it. At breakfast, I would try to complete my homework for school so I could pass the classes. At the same time, I was overlooking my work schedule for the week to come. Since I had gotten my job, school seemed to drag out even more so than it once did. I would sit in my class and try not to drift off. While trying to keep my head up, I would stare out the window, and sometimes I could have sworn I would see a man standing outside. When I turned 16, I picked up another job just so we could keep our electricity and water on. At night, I didn't bother to sleep. I would just lie in bed with my light off, listening to the still movements through the thin walls of my room. I was used to hearing the footsteps around my house. It didn't bother me, but what did was what was in my room itself. When I did manage to fall asleep, it wouldn't be for long. I'd be in between awake and asleep, and feel this thing standing over me. I felt like, if I fell asleep, I wouldn't wake up. My body would jolt up and shake, and I'd look around my room to find nothing there. This continued until I actually dared to fall asleep. Nightmares greeted me and tortured me until I woke up. At this point, I began to tell my parents of my experiences, but they just pushed it off as teenage drama. I had stopped telling them about it after that. But things only seemed to get worse. I would wake up to the feeling of being choked, or just unable to move my body, period. I would run upstairs once whatever was there released me. The nights I could sleep, I'd wake up in pain the next morning, with scratches on my body, or even bruises that looked like I'd been bitten. No matter what I'd said or shown them, no one seemed to believe me. I was alone in this. I was suffering and no one seemed to even notice or even care. 
days I would come home from school, my room wouldn't be how I left it. Things would go missing, or when I tried to sleep at night, things would get thrown around. I tried sleeping upstairs only to get yelled at by my parents, and when I tried to explain why, they would just get madder and call me a liar. One night, I'd finally gotten fed up with it and challenged it to show itself. If it wanted to torment me, at least do it without hiding like a coward. A few nights after, things were quiet. I was worn out from a double shift I'd pulled that night, and I was lying in bed, facing the wall on my side. That was until I heard a soft giggle. I squeezed my eyes shut even more, not daring to look at what stood near. At least I was, until it spoke. Good night, Mummy. I turned over to see a small child standing a few feet from my bed. He was staring straight at me, a small smile on his face. He seemed out of place. He had dark hair and was dressed in clothes you'd find in a history book. He was as solid as a normal person. Darkness seemed to form around his back like he was connected to something. I glanced above him to see a large misshapen shadow. It looked like a tall male figure whose arm was stuffed into the child's back. After I told my parents of that night, I was moved into a safer environment. I feel comfy here. Though the white walls can be a bit annoying to stare at, it's quite comfy here. Sometimes I get the occasional visit, and I was even given a new white jacket to wear. I think I'm going to like it here. In any city, in any country, go to any mental institution or halfway house you can get yourself to. Wait for an ambulance to arrive and unload its patient. As long as the patient is alive, no matter how mangled he may be, ask him to see the holder of health. Should the patient you're talking to die at any time during or after you've asked to see the holder, the object you're after is no longer there. Run for your insignificant life and do not stop until the sun rises the next morning. If the object you seek is still there, the patient will go into a massive seizure and the medical staff accompanying him in the ambulance will try to save him. The patient will then gut out the medical staff using whatever is at hand at the time. During this time, you must not move from your current position or the patient will come for you next. Once the patient is done with his victims, you may ask only one thing, lest you be mangled for eternity. What was the price for longevity? The patient will then tell a horrific story. Every malpractice, every accident, every excuse and every experiment in medical history to result in what people find today as convenience. He will then explain the true price of convenience, that sacrifice and convenience go together, as do day and night, that the greater the convenience one wants, the greater the sacrifice one must give. If your sanity is intact after this horrific story, you must react fast as the patient will lose his patience and lunge towards you. Grab for the syringe that wasn't there before beside you and stab it into his head or whatever is left of it should a head injury be his original need for an ambulance. He will soon die and you must extract a liquid that comes from his head. This syringe will never run out of the liquid inside it and it will not extract any other liquid. Inserting some of the liquid inside of you through the syringe will give you demonic strength for a certain time, depending on how much you put into yourself. Beware, however, since that liquid draws itself from the life force of the people you care about most. The syringe is object 122 of 538. You now know the price. It is up to you to decide whether you can afford it or not. What would happen to him if he got caught was about as mysterious as what horrors awaited man after death. 
He wore slippers to muffle his footfalls, and he synchronised the turning of the knob with the roar of a passing by car, preluded by a sheet of light running across the walls. His parents would make him sleep outside for a fortnight if they knew he was out of bed. He dreaded their actions when they found out why he was there. He twisted the bobby pin with the skill of an expert thief, even though his hand shook. If they would make him sit in a fucking closet for ten hours and eat some measly undercooked steak for Christmas dinner, he will have his own fun. The lock clicked. His prize gleamed in the moonlight, streaming in through the window. He reached out for it when the floorboards upstairs creaked. Suddenly, light spilled out over the stairs. One of them was using the bathroom. In the cabinet stood a bottle of gin, dark brandy, and crystal clear vodka. John lifted up the vodka and examined it for any markings indicating the level of liquid. He found a black line just above the label. He raised it. He glanced upstairs and back to the cabinet before continuing. John uncapped the bottle. It smelt of freedom and rebellion, bitter and strong. John took a good chug. A wave of warmth filled his body. The wave drew back to reveal a burning in John's throat. He wiped his lips, popped a tic-tac, and drew a new line with black marker. All noise upstairs stopped, but John took no chances. He moved with the softness of a pillow, hoping those tyrants were asleep. John's heart pounded like a heavy metal drummer. John started hyperventilating and his vision blurred. He mounted the stairs while steadying his shaking legs. Calm down. No one ever died because of a small sip, John thought. His hand shook as he clutched the banister to pull his faltering legs up the stairs. I'll pull myself into bed and never drink a drop again. He was nearly there. Just two more steps. A paroxysm of pain shot through John's head and his legs gave out as he tumbled down the stairs and crashed against the front door. His parents stood at the head of the stairs, shadowed and unmoving. He's been a bad boy, has he not, dear? John's mother said. Shame about the alcohol, her husband said. Now we're going to have to throw it out. There's nothing to counteract the toxin, is there? I just narrowly avoided getting into a crash this morning on the way to work. Those people behind me sure didn't, though. I want to draw you, she said. She didn't mention the hanging and quartering. I woke up thinking my dog was barking at something outside. But it was already inside. The activists were devastated when their final appeal was rejected and the development that would destroy an entire habitat was given the green light. They just couldn't convince the council that humans were a species worth preserving. Ron closed the doors behind him, intent on showing his son the closet was nothing to worry about. Tristan sat a safe distance away from the closet still calling out for his dad long after the sun came up. She has always been afraid of growing old alone. Now you won't have to, said the crazed butcher as he hung her beside the decomposing bodies of five other women. I wasn't very upset when I found out I was going deaf. At least now I won't have to hear the screams of the people Daddy keeps downstairs. There's a great reason why the monster hiding under your bed is hiding. It's because he doesn't want to mess with the one watching you sleep. As the police dragged him away, the madman screamed that his sacrifices were the only thing that kept the beast contained. While I will certainly miss the easy meal, it will do me good to finally stretch my wings again. 
my grandpa and dad shared the same last words. Are you still holding the ladder? The other jurors were really upset that I voted not guilty and he went free. But there was no way I was going to let anyone else get credit for all the horrible things I had done to those families. I finally regain consciousness and see all the freshly fallen snow around me. The huge face in the sky smiles, and I know he's going to shake my dome up yet again. Yesterday, I bought a nice painting of a woman sitting on a chair. But now there's only the chair. I squeezed my grandmother's hand as she lied dead in her coffin. I wasn't expecting her to squeeze back. After I discovered how to make myself immortal, I decided to throw myself off the top of a skyscraper to test it. As I hit the ground, breaking every bone in my body, I realise I can't die, but I can still feel pain. You see, I'm a simple college student, living alone in an apartment. I was very enthusiastic about the release of Pokemon Heart Gold Soul Silver here in the States. I have purposely locked myself out of all media and the internet aside for school purposes. That means no 4chan, no vboard, no Bulbapedia, etc. As I was busy with the school year and being poor at the time, I wasn't able to buy Soul Silver on its launch date. After my school year ended, I ordered Soul Silver on Amazon. However, it would take a week for it to arrive. I decided that during that time, I would play my crystal version on my Game Boy Color. However, I realized that long ago, my mum threw it away because I told her the save went dead, and I was very upset about it then. She also threw away my silver version, so all I have is my Game Boy Color. As such, I set out to GameStop and bought a used silver version, as it's the only Pokemon game left that they have for Game Boy Color. Ten dollars. Fairly cheap. I went home and started it up for a nostalgia trip. However, that's where things started getting bizarre, and most likely the reason why you read this. The Game Freak logo started up as normal, but it just froze there. I thought the cart was just errored or something, so I turned it off and on. The same thing happened. I tried pressing A and Start over and over and all of the buttons. Eventually the logo vanished and there was a black screen for about 5 seconds. Suddenly, rather than going to the usual menu screen, I was already in the game in a previous saved file which was odd as I was expecting all of these carts to have been wiped by the poor battery. Either way, I wasn't complaining, as I would have chosen the continue option to see what the previous guy did anyways. First off, I checked his trainer information. His name was just dot dot dot. He didn't have much originality. I checked his profile and apparently he had 999.99 hours put into the game with all 16 badges 99,999.9 Poké Dollars and all 251 Pokémon on the Pokédex. Seeing as he apparently had Mew and Celebi logged also, I'm guessing he either used a Game Genie or was a really hardcore Pokémon player back then. I checked his Pokémon to see what a badass team he has. To my surprise, I saw five unknowns and a sixth Pokémon named Hurry. I'm thinking that this must be some cruel joke by the person who last played this game, but I decided to check the profiles of the Pokemon anyways. As expected, there were different letters of unknown, all level 5. I was a bit shaky with my unknown alphabet at the time, but I identified the word spelled out to be leave. As for the sixth Pokemon, it turned out to be a Cyndaquil. Mind you, this was before there were individualised Pokemon icons. The Cyndaquil looked normal, but it was level 5 with only 1 HP left with only 2 attacks, Leer and Flash. 
I don't know why they named him Hurry, but at the time I just disregarded it. The most eerie thing was that, despite my volume being at max, none of the Pokemon he had said their usual cries, just pure silence. Having enough of the team, I closed it. I was parked at what appears to be a room inside Bellsprout Tower. However, for some reason, there were no NPCs around. Even more eerie is that the pillar in the middle didn't move at all, as if just leaning on its side. There was no music at all, and there was no exit or ladder. At least I thought there wasn't. I walked around for a few minutes, but can't seem to find a way out. This was certainly not a room I've seen in the Bellsprout Tower before. I tried checking my items for an escape rope, but the bag was completely empty. There wasn't any wild Pokemon either. Finally, I managed to find a ladder, which turned out to be behind the pillar. The screen turned black, and the music finally started playing. I had a sudden chill, as I recognised that melody I heard to be the theme you hear when you listened to the radio at the Alf Ruins, where the unknown are at. I immediately realised that it wasn't a loading transition, but rather I was in a dark room and would need flash. Before I took care of that though, I immediately checked my poker gear to change the radio to something more pleasant, but it turns out that there was no radio card, or even a phone, nor time cards. There was only a map card in which gold, dot 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 from earlier, and I will call him gold from now on, was just walking in a midst of black. I recalled that Cyndaquil has flash, so I turned off my poker gear and made Cyndaquil use flash. I didn't see any message saying, hurry has used flash or anything like that. The room just became lit, just like that. And I soon regretted it. The room was a chilling blood red with a linear grey path heading south. The ladder I used to go up or down was not there at all. I had no choice but to head south. The screen got darker every 20 steps I made until I finally made it to the end, which appears to be a sign. I read the sign, which said, turn back now. Suddenly I was asked to answer yes or no, but there was no question asked. I chose yes as I do not know what it was asking, and the screen went black again, making a ladder climbed sound. The unknown radio music stopped, and in a few seconds was replaced with the not as creepy pokey flute radio music. I was in another dark room, but I held my breath and used flash again. Suddenly it said that hurry has fainted, which was odd since I recall that there was no status conditions like poison on him and I clearly wasn't in a battle. I checked my Pokemon quickly and suddenly he's no longer in my party. In fact, after a bit of investigating, none of my Pokemon are there, but instead all replaced with level 10 unknown. I did the same thing as before and spelled out the unknown. My then team of unknown spelled, he died. Either way, after that creepy change, The room was lit to reveal myself in a very small room that appears to be only four squares big. The walls of that room were grey bricks, as if I was inside something that was hollowed out. Outside that room appears to be a bunch of graves similar to the ones in Pokemon Red and Blue. I've walked around that small room and pressed A, but nothing happened. I've already concluded that this was clearly a hacked game and some sadistic fuck sold it to GameStop. However, my curiosity kept me going. I checked the trainer profile of dot dot dot, again only to find out that the sprite of gold was missing his arms. He also seems to appear less smug, but rather seems more sad and empty in a way that I do not know how to describe. For some reason... It also now said that he has 24 badges, which was clearly impossible. After a few minutes of aimless wandering, my character suddenly spun and did the escape rope spinning animation. Instead of flying up though, my character spun downwards slowly as if sinking. After that screen, the music stopped. After finally landing, the overworld sprite of gold is coloured differently now. 
Instead of the usual red colour he dons, he appears completely white now, including his skin. It's as if he came straight from the colourless Game Boy games, placed into a coloured background of the Game Boy colour. I checked his profile, and now, while now, is as white as his overworld sprite. He lost his legs, and what appears to be bloody tears from his eyes. It also says now, he has 32 badges, which now starts to disturb me, as this change of number seems to represent something important. I also checked my Pokemon, which this time contains 5 unknowns and a level 100 Celebi without a nickname. The unknown are this time level 15 and spell out DYING. I checked the Celebi profile, it was a shiny Celebi, except there's only half of the sprite. One leg, one arm, one eye. It only has one attack. Perish Song. The area I was in itself was the Sprout Tower, with the immobile pillar as before, except everything is apparently red now. I walked north for what felt like forever. Eventually, I finally encountered some generic men and women NPC. They were all lined up to the side, just facing the long slantish pillar in the middle. They were also white, and nothing happens when I try to speak to them. I kept on going north until eventually the pillar finally appears chopped off, with a transparent red in that spot. I went up to red, and without even pressing A, I was suddenly engaged and finally in a battle. The music starts again which it sounds like the unknown radio music again, but played backwards. Gold's battle back sprite matches his front one, with the bloody eyes, white skin and lack of arms, while red sprite was the same as before in GSC, except transparent. The text simply said, wants to battle, as if he had no name, and both of us only have one Pokemon each, which is weird as I swore I had six with the unknowns. My shiny Celebi came out, conveniently with half a sprite for the back sprite also. The shiny noise and animation was different, as the sounds it made sounds like multiple screech attacks used consecutively. Red sent out a seemingly normal male Pikachu, except he's level 255 and his sprite seems sad and has tears in his eyes. Rather than the usual fight item Pokemon run menu, I was only given the option to use attacks. Since Celebi only has one, I chose it. Naturally, since Pikachu was level 255, he went first. Pikachu used Curse, lowering his speed and increasing his other stats. I'm not even sure if Pikachu could use Curse. Celebi used Perish Song. In three turns, both Pokemon got KO'd. Not like I have a choice. At this point, it didn't even go back to the fight menu, as the battle just continued without me. Also note that there were no animations at all for some reason. Pikachu used Flail, which didn't do much damage despite his level and boost, as his health was maxed. Celebi used Perish Song. Nothing happens as it was already used. Pikachu used Frustration which did a shit ton of damage, knocking Celebi down to less than 10 HP. Celebi used Pain Split, which surprised me as Celebi didn't even have that attack in the first place. Now Celebi and Pikachu have about 150 HP. Pikachu used Mean Look. Not like that did anything. As expected, due to the effects of Perish Song, my Celebi fainted. Except in the text it said Celebi has died. And instead of the ordinary drop off the screen animation, the Celebi back sprite just vanished. For some reason, the Pikachu was still up, even with the Perish song, and it didn't count as my loss. Pikachu used one more different attack beyond the five attack limit. Pikachu used Destiny Bond. Afterwards, it said Pikachu has died, with a slow fade out animation. Apparently I was the winner, as the transparent red sprite showed up and said dot 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 dot. 
At that point, I just freaked out, as that transparent red sprite was suddenly beheaded, leaving nothing but his transparent body. The battle then ended at that point and faded out along with the music. I'm back in the overworld, with another change to the gold sprite. He's now as transparent as Red's overworld sprite. I quickly checked Gold's profile, where this time the only thing remains of him is his head with a transparent skin. The head was zoomed in a bit, showing a black void in his eyes. It now stated that he now has 40 badges. I then backed out and checked my Pokemon. They were all level 20, shiny, unknown, which spelled out red, no more. I was at what I now know is next to the end. There was apparently no music playing, but for some reason I felt like something, something was there that could be heard. I was back in my room in New Bark Town. Maybe I finally get to play this game properly, but who am I kidding? I knew that sadistic fuck must have done something. I walked around my room to interact with my things, as I'm a bit afraid to go downstairs and see what's awaiting down there. Note I said walked, as while the background was moving, Gold was not moving his transparent limbs at all while doing so, just floating like those ghosts you see in Diamond and Pearl. As expected, the radio, computer and TV did not work, so I had no choice but to go down the stairs. I ended up in the same lower level room of my house. Everything appears normal except Mum isn't home. After failing to interact with anything in this room, I decided to go outside. To my surprise, that door leading outside at the south didn't work and instead I just walked straight through it to a void. I continued moving south to see what the fuck was going on. My house vanishes as I head south into the void. It was creepy as when I entered the void, the outline on Gold's transparent sprite turned white to contrast with the pitch black. Eventually, I reached a white area and Gold's sprite turned black and transparent again. I continued south without thinking of stopping at all. After a long trek south, I finally encountered something. It was Gold's regular sprite. I talked to it. He said goodbye forever, dot, dot, dot. Notably with a space in between the forever and dot, dot, dot. And vanished. As that happened, it said, question mark used nightmare, which at that point, I would not deny that being impossible. Gold did another escape rope animation, spinning slowly downwards like before. I'm now back into that small hollowed out room surrounded by graves earlier, or at least I say I was back there, as there's no sprite anymore. I tried to walk around, but nothing moved, not even wall bumping noise. I checked my trainer profile with absolutely no gold sprite left. It said I have zero badges and all the pictures of the Johto gym leaders at the bottom were replaced with skulls. I checked my Pokemon, which were all level 25 unknown. As expected, it spelled out a phrase that I dared to read. I'm dead. As soon as I went back to the overworld, the room I was supposedly in was then covered with the same blocks as the walls. I then figured out what exactly that room was when the final text was said R.I.P. dot dot dot. That room was a big grave, surrounded by other graves. Gold has already been dead. He died, presumably, a few years after he defeated Red. He was a young trainer who, despite his efforts in collecting so many badges and attempts at becoming a Pokemon master, was still unable to avoid the inevitable fate of death, and his efforts were eventually forgotten by the next generation. I was unable to escape from that text, no matter what I pressed. I tried resetting the game, and the same thing happened, at which I then finally decided to give up on that horrible nightmare. After that experience, I will never look at the gimmick unknown the same way again. 
They say that only the first generation have folk tales and legends, but the second generation have shown me how unpleasant the truth can be. I eventually enjoyed Soul Silver immensely, but I still can't unthink what that rigged game has told me.